good to see everybody again. Good to be back with you this evening. Uh, I want you to think for a moment with me back to one of the greatest, if not the greatest, narratives in all of our scriptures. It is this narrative upon which we uh, base the foundation for our faith because Abraham was known as the father of the faithful. And in Abraham, God asked the question, can man give as I'm prepared to give? Will man give his only begotten son simply because I ask him to? And we've been studying about this story, this narrative uh, on Wednesday nights. Brother Merrill Mann's teaching a class. We're in there. It's a very uh, good class. I like that, that book and, and what Jonathan Jenkins has to say about Abraham. But think about, think about Genesis chapter 12 with me. God comes to Abraham and says, I need you to go. That's it. The Hebrew writer will tell us that he went out not knowing where he was going. He just went because God said, I need you to go. And God said, I'm going to take you to a land that it's going to be the land that I give you. Now, if you are talking with God and God says, I'm going to give you some land, what kind of land do you think this land's going to be? Well, that's going to be the best land that I could ever imagine, land that is given by God. And God says, I've got some land that I want to give to you. I'm going to make you a great nation there. Just go. And so Abraham goes, and he's walking, and he's walking, and he gets to that land. And you would imagine, what, what would I imagine? I'm, I'm just giddy with expectation to round that hillside and see my land. Abraham gets there, and it's famine-stricken. And he can't stay in his new land. He has to keep on going. And so he keeps on going. And he goes south, 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 until he gets to the land of Egypt. And there in the land of Egypt, you know what happens. Uh, he becomes fearful because he has a, a wife that he knows is desirable. And so he says, please help me to deceive these people. Just say that you're my sister. And sure enough, Pharaoh does desire Sarah, and he asks for her. And she goes into his household, and yet Pharaoh's household is stricken by God because of Sarah. And Pharaoh gives Sarah back to Abram. And says, please leave. And they leave. And it's probably, it seems like, at some point in this visit here to Egypt, that Abram picks up another traveler. Because we're told that Sarah had a handmaid, an Egyptian handmaiden by the name of Hagar. And where else would he have gotten this Egyptian handmaid but in this visit? Uh, Hagar is probably not her given name. Uh, she's an Egyptian. Remember, Hagar is a Hebrew name. And as a matter of fact, it's a Hebrew name that means stranger. They took her in and they named her stranger. If you can just imagine being taken into a strange people's household that do not speak your language, they do not observe your customs, they remove you from your homeland and take you far off on a journey to which place you do not know where you are going now. And they name you stranger. You would feel very much like a stranger, I imagine. Hagar is stranger in every sense of the word. And then when her master and his wife cannot conceive a child, you, Hagar, are told that it's going to be your duty now, your responsibilities, to have sexual relations with your master and to bear a child in the name of your mistress. Boy, can you just imagine for a moment if you were called to this? If you were Hagar, not really a choice in the matter. This is her mistress Sarah's idea, not her idea. And yet when it's a successful idea, now she's even hated because of that. Because she could conceive a child to her master, whereas her mistress could not. And now her mistress begins to mistreat her. Can you just sympathize with Hagar for just a moment? Can you just try to imagine what it must have been like to be Hagar? I know that this child, Ishmael, will be one who causes many, many troubles for the Israelite nation, for our world today. The Ishmaelites, the, uh, the Muslim nation, uh, which has now spread far and wide, uh, has become a very troublesome people. And it was prophesied as such that they would be a people of the sword. But from Hagar's perspective, this is nothing short of sexual slavery. She did not have any choice in this matter. And now this is the walk that she's been called to. She's being mistreated at a very vulnerable time in her life. Ladies, if you've ever been pregnant, men, if you've ever lived through a pregnancy with your wife, you will know that this is a time in a woman's life in which she needs a little bit extra care. And yet Hagar is hated. 
She's not getting pickles and ice cream at midnight. She's not getting 12 pillows on the sofa. She's being hated. She's being driven out of her own tent. And she runs out into the midst of the wilderness where we read this. Genesis chapter 16, if you want to go there with me, we'll see an encounter with Hagar and the Lord in which we find the name of God, which we want to talk about tonight. Genesis chapter 16, beginning in verse 7. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I'm fleeing from my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God of seeing. For she said, Truly here I have seen him who looks after me. A God of seeing, the name of the Lord, El Roy, a God of seeing. The translators translate this in many different ways. The New Revised Standard just keeps the Hebrew, your El Roy. Uh, the New King James has a hyphenated name there. You are the God who sees, which is similar to the New American Standard. Uh, the ESV, which I read, you are a God of seeing, King James, thou God seest me. Remember who's saying this. You are a God who sees. This is the little girl named Stranger who's saying this. She's used to hearing and experiencing that God is a God who speaks to Abraham. God is a God who loves Abraham, who makes promises to Abraham, and who leads Abraham about. If anything, this is Sarai's God. This is a God who listens to Sarai and who speaks to her, and who makes promises for her, and who cares for her. There's a whole nother lesson which we're not going to get into tonight. There's a whole nother sermon to be had. Do we in the church make the lost know that they are those who God sees? Or are they just strangers, outsiders to God? This is an aha moment for Sarah when it clicks and she realizes God even sees me. Little old stranger, God even sees me me and she calls upon this God you really are a God who sees what would this do for our concept our perception of God to have this realization God is a God that sees me tonight I want to talk about three different areas of our life in which God is a God who sees us God is a God who sees us when we're in trouble as here with Hagar God is a God who sees us when we're being tempted And God is a God who sees us in our triumph. He sees us in our trouble, in our temptation, and in our triumph. And I want to talk about each of these three for just a moment tonight. When we talk about God being a God of our troubles, uh, one of the common images of God comes to mind that we read throughout Scripture, and that is that of a shepherd. God is a shepherd. Now, you may have heard before about how, how dumb and how defenseless sheep are. Uh, They are are known to just have no way about them in which they defend themselves, no wits about them in which they uh, care for themselves in a common sense kind of way. Sheep have actually been known to follow each other so blindly that they will walk off of a cliff to their death because they're not looking where they're going. They'll walk around all day long with their head down in the hot, hot sun, never seeking shade to the point where they get a sunburn on the top of their head. David said, you anoint my head with oil, as he's speaking to his good shepherd. They have no defense system. They don't even pretend. They can't bark. They can't hiss. They can't coil up and pretend like they're about to defend themselves. They have about eight pounds of Velcro covering their bodies. They can't get away. They can't run. They can't even see very well. They don't have good hearing. They are the only animal that it has been proven that once domesticated cannot become feral. They cannot go back wild once they have domesticated. And God says, that's you. I'm your shepherd. You are just like a sheep. 
You depend upon me so heavily. You cannot take care of yourself to the, to the extent such that I liken you to a sheep and I am your shepherd. The most prominent image of God who sees his children in time of trouble is that of a shepherd caring after his flock. Is it not fitting that the best king that Israel ever had, aside from Jesus Christ, Jesus is the king of Israel, but aside from Jesus Christ, the best king that Israel ever had was David, a shepherd. And God did not take this shepherd and turn him into nobility. God took this shepherd and he let him shepherd his people. He was exactly what God was looking for, the shepherd king. Hands down, the most prolific king in Israelite history, the Messiah, is the king who sits on the throne of David. He's the seed of David. And he was a shepherd king. Even in warfare, 1 Samuel chapter 17, is David is giving his military credentials. No, I can go up against this giant. Here is why King Saul, as he's given his military credentials, he gives them in shepherd's terms. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. For he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. David is the ideal king shepherd of God's people, not only recognizing his duty to shepherd the people, but recognizing the fact that his shepherd is shepherding him as he does so. God doesn't take a shepherd and turn him into a king. God takes a shepherd and he lets him shepherd. And that is the God who takes care of who watches over his people in times of trouble. He's a shepherd. It's important to see Jesus and the Father from this angle because it helps us answer those tough questions in those tough moments of life. Where is God? Where is God? To know that God in the person of Jesus Christ has come to shepherd his people to the point of even suffering sacrifice himself in the so doing to see God from that angle gives me the answer that I need. Where is God? God is the same place he's always been. He is the same place he was when his son was hanging over that cross. He's at the same place that he was then when his son was crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's a shepherd. And he doesn't always go around the trouble with his people. Many times he goes through the trouble with his people. He sees us in times of trouble. God is a God who sees us, and he sees us in times of temptation. Uh, of one of the scriptures that I, I constantly need to remind myself is this, Psalm 69 and verse 5. Oh God, you know my folly. You know my folly. The wrongs I have done are not hidden from you. You know, we, we may find ourselves, we scoff at Jonah, but we may find ourselves falling into the Jonah trap all too often. Maybe I can just pretend like that didn't happen. Maybe I can just pretend like I didn't get myself into that situation. If I can move past it and I can do better going forward, I can just pretend like I'm an all right guy, that I never have any sins, that I, I never would fall to any temptations, and I can have a relationship with God based on the fact that I'm an all right guy and I'm not all that bad after all. David says, God knows my foolishness. There's no hiding this from God. Why even try to hide from God the truth about me? He already knows. And everybody has been there. Maybe it was a season of your life. Maybe it was one thing that you did. Maybe it's something that's still going on from time to time. But whatever it is for you, we all know that sin of ours that we don't even want to think about it. We don't want to even acknowledge that it is there or that it was there. We don't even want to call it to mind. Much less do we want anyone else to know about it. Much less do we want our God to know that it's there. And we would love to just sweep it under the, under the rug and pretend like it never was there. But God is a God who sees. God is a God who sees us in our temptation. God is a God who knows who we are. And, and it's, it's an amazing thought to me that there are many who want to clean their lives up and then come to God. I'm going to get straight and then I'm going to come to the church. Then I'm going to come to God. Then I'm going to become a Christian. I'm going to get straight first that's not what the church is all about. That's not what our God is all about. God wrote this book not after seeing a perfect people and saying, here's how you can be like this perfect people. God wrote this book after seeing a broken people, sin after sin after sin, and he wrote about it 
He wrote about sin and brokenness. And he understands sin and brokenness. There's no sense in pretending that it's not there. God is a God who sees. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 16. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? That's a pretty scary thought when I think about a God that always sees, that sees me in my temptations. He dwells within me in the midst of my temptations. When I have failures and shortcomings, sins, God is a God who dwells within his people. And there's a real fear that, that when I realize that I can't get around this, that I can't get away from God, so many times this thought alone drives people away. The guilt, the shame, God was there. God was dwelling within me when I did that. How could I show my face to God? How could I show my face amongst God's people? And so often people run and they hide for fear of the shame. But the, the purpose of this passage is not to instill guilt. The purpose of this passage is not to instill shame, but to instill power. Do you not know that God's Spirit dwells within you? That's powerful. That's powerful. God, Emmanuel, God with us. He's with his people. And when we transgress, when we misstep, when we sin, how does God see his people? David, Psalm 103, verse 10 beginning. He does not deal with us according to our sins nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are but dust. In our temptation, he is our power to overcome. We studied a week or two ago, sin is not my master. Sin is not my master. God with us, it's the power to overcome and to beat back sin. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our frame. He knows that we are but dust, and he judges us according to his compassion. He doesn't want you to live in shame, but to live in power. He is a God who sees us in our times of trouble. He is a God who sees us in our temptations. And God is a God who sees us in our triumph. In our world today, it can become very disheartening because so many times sin is exalted, righteousness is scoffed at. Those who follow God, again I will refer back to this, are referred to as those who follow a God delusion. And we're cast as bigoted. Spiritual triumphs are minimized. And righteousness is laughed at. When there are so many enemies of our God, so many enemies of the godly way, you might ask, why try? Why try? Why spend my wills? Why expend the energy? If there's no payoff, if there's nothing to be shown for it here in this life, why even try? And the Apostle Paul, he would give us a little encouragement on how to judge this situation because he would remind us that we have a God who sees us in our spiritual triumphs. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3 beginning, But with me it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I'm not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from the Lord. You can count on it. God sees your triumphs. He sees, and it's a big deal to him. It's a big deal to him. If we have the faith to believe, truly believe that this great day is coming and we know that we will receive our reward from him if we know that a cup of cold water given in his name will not lose its reward, how great that is to know that we have a God who sees. Even if the world does not uh, commend us for righteousness, we have a God who sees us in spiritual triumph. Job says it this way in Job 31, Does not he see my ways and number all my steps? If I have walked with falsehood and my foot has hastened to deceit, let me be weighed in a just balance and let God know my integrity. Isn't that great? In the ash heap with boils from head to toe, suffering through what Job has suffered through, he has the presence of mind 
to say this, God, let God judge me. God knows. I'm looking forward to God's judgment, not what anybody else thinks about me at this time. And where did he say that God was? Uh, this is both a time of trouble and of triumph for God. Did he wonder where God was? No, he knew where God was. He had many questions for God, and yet he knew where his God was. He knew his triumph in his Lord. There was never any turning back for Job. This evening, do you know the triumph that you have or could have in God? Do you know this God? Have you given your life to the God who sees you? He is a God who sees you in trouble as a shepherd. He is a God who sees you in temptation as a compassionate father who knows your frame. He is a God who sees you in triumph as your ultimate rewarder. And as we extend this invitation, as we prepare to extend this invitation, I question, I think that we would all here benefit from greatly is this, how does it make you feel to know that you serve a God who sees? We have a God who sees, and that should be a great comfort to us. If you're here tonight and you're not a child of God, I want to encourage you to come to Him. If you're here and you are a Christian, yet you've wandered away, I want to encourage you to come back to Him. If you have any need to come, please come while we stand and while we sing. Okay.